Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. A California appeals court orders a review of the infamous murder conviction of Scott Peterson. What's it mean for the case? Exclusive interviews are coming up. Plus, a judge orders the release of new video in the cases against the officers accused of killing George Floyd. Also, a major meth bust on the West Coast. The shocking volume of drugs seized. And you'll hear from an admitted murderer who wants to change his guilty plea as he blames an attorney he once tried to fire for botching his case. Law and Crime Daily covers court cases. Buddy to Law and Crime Daily, I'm Aaron Keller along with Terry Austin. Brian Buckmeyer is off tonight. The California Supreme Court has ordered the murder conviction of Scott Peterson to be re-examined. Peterson was convicted of murdering his wife Lacey and their unborn child Connor on Christmas Eve 2002. But the state's highest court is now telling a San Mateo County judge to determine if Peterson should get a new trial. The court is agreeing with an appeal filed by Peterson's defense on one matter, writing, Juror number 7 committed prejudicial misconduct by not disclosing her prior involvement with other legal proceedings, including, but not limited to, being the victim of a crime. Peterson was sentenced to death, but the state Supreme Court overturned that punishment in a separate appeal this past summer. Peterson's defense says he did not get a fair trial. But we have publicity in this case that covers inadmissible evidence, evidence that didn't exist, evidence that was ruled inadmissible, uh, things like the, the attorney general's of uh, the state's statement that the conviction was certain, they had a lock solid winner, uh, statements like uh, articles about defense counsel believing his client was guilty, uh, uh, articles about evidence that had been specifically ruled inadmissible, articles covering evidence that didn't even exist. We have a situation here. We had those billboards placed outside on, on the freeway uh, as with a picture of Scott Peterson asking prospective jurors to vote man or monster for the telephone number. State prosecutors, meanwhile, insist Scott Peterson's conviction should be upheld in part because they argued the trial was fair. That there was an ebb and flow to the coverage in this case. And most of the coverage, understandably, occurred when Lacey went missing. And so by the time we got to trial, there had been basically an ebb in, in the publicity. And so therefore my suggestion, Your Honors, is that those surveys were highly probative when the evidence when the publicity was at its highest. And as the trial judge I think said here, the only place that this case could have gone where no one would have heard about it was Mars. And that was true. Everyone had heard about this case. Many questions here. Attorney Mark Garagos represented Peterson at trial. He joins us now live on this broadcast. Attorney Garagos, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good to see you here. Peterson filed this petition for habeas corpus in 2015, and the state court disagreed with... <laughs> 18 of the 19 claims. So this is primarily just a dispute about the juror who failed to disclose that she once feared for the life of her own unborn child because her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend was harassing her. What was your fear during trial? Was your fear that that juror might sympathize too closely with victim Lacey Peterson, or was it just a fear that that juror lied during voir dire? Well, look, this is what had happened. The Supreme Court first, as you talked about in the setup piece, just reversed the death, the death penalty. So they have the option now of retrying the penalty phase. But before they got to that or made a decision, they now have uh, issued what's called an OSC, order to show cause, to the trial court as to why the conviction should not be set aside. And you aptly put, they specifically honed in on this one issue, and this issue is a significant issue. We complained in real time 20 years ago that we kept exposing or finding what I called at the time stealth jurors, meaning jurors who were lying and had an agenda to get on here. And frankly, every single one that we identified was lying to get on here to convict them. We caught a couple of them in real time. This juror, we did not. But I was not as concerned about her at, at least when she was an alternate. When she, after the judge uh, pulled off and eliminated a couple of jurors who had indicated that they, um, that they were hung, she was placed into the jury, and she is obviously a troubled young woman. 
And, and the subsequent investigation showed that when she filled out the forms, she had absolutely lied about the uh, fact that she had had a restraining order and that she had had an encounter with another woman. And that was exactly what another juror who we had found and exposed during voir dire had done. And then later, so that that other juror had admitted that she was lying to get on there to fry Scott, her words, fry Scott. So this is a significant issue. Obviously, I've maintained for close to 17 years that Scott is innocent and that this was a um, this was a mob verdict. And hopefully now he'll get the justice he deserves. So the core of the case here, though, appears to be intact. You know, all of these other points that were raised during this specific appeal, uh, issues about whether or not uh, the state improperly presented evidence about the growth of the unborn child, about the dog scent, about uh, exactly where the bodies were alleged to have been placed in the water, about your own defense strategy, and these questions about whether Lacey was seen by other people walking the dog after Scott went to uh, go fishing. Those questions, the appeals court turned around and said, we apparently don't have a big issue with those. So is the core state's case strong enough here? Because it appears that remains intact. Well, it doesn't really matter at this point. If they find that she had committed the error that she that they've already found, which is an OSC means there's basically probable cause, prima facie, they've made a, you've made a case out that there was prejudicial um, uh, uh, effect or conduct. If that's the case, none of that other stuff matters because you have to set aside the conviction. So we can argue about the other stuff, and frankly, that will probably end up in the uh, federal court if this doesn't uh, uh, gain traction. But it's already gained traction. I think that, frankly, what's happening here is that the Supreme, the Cal Supreme, knew, knows exactly what they're doing. They had said, remember, the exact reason that they said they reversed the death penalty is because the prosecution had sat back and let the judge, over our objections at trial, seat jurors who were pro-prosecution, who were pro-death penalty, and had eliminated all jurors who said that they had issues with the death penalty. Uh, my argument has always been, if that's the case, and that's the law, and clearly it is the law from the U.S. Supreme Court to the California Supreme Court, how does a juror who is pro-prosecution for the penalty phase, not pro-prosecution for the guilt phase? Well, now we're going to find out, because if this juror did commit what it appears she did do, then the verdict itself is tainted and must be thrown out. Biased jurors are a huge concern. I have seen judges in other cases we have covered here turn around and claw a verdict back and say we've got to start from scratch because of an issue with a juror. It happened in the Shana Huber's case in northern Kentucky near Cincinnati, for instance. And that was another high-profile case where this was an issue, slightly different issue, but it's happened. So, okay, what does it mean if your former client gets a new trial? How does that play out? What it means, uh, what it means and if you play it out, there's no way they convict him. I, I just don't believe that's going to happen. I mean, people can talk about he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. The fact is, nobody knew, knows or knew that evidence better than our team did in real time. And there wasn't a single person on the team who didn't feel as if they, there was a complete collapse of any evidence. By the way, including the trial judge at various times during this case. Um, and so there, I, there, there is no... There is no, to my mind, justice that has been for Lacey, for Scott, for Connor, or for either of the families. Attorney Mark Garagos, appreciate you joining us here on Law & Crime Daily for the insight. You were there for it. You know it perhaps better than anybody else. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I want to switch now very quickly to Terry Austin and Eklan Mercy, a criminal defense attorney in Atlanta, Georgia, who is also joining us. Uh, Terry, real quick here, your thoughts on this. Does this case deserve to go to get a new trial based on what we know about this juror? Well, you know, the interesting thing about this juror is she might have been asked, were you involved in other court proceedings or a lawsuit? And she may not have understood that the restraining order is a court proceeding. Actually, it really doesn't matter what her understanding was. If, in fact, she did not answer that question correctly, it could very well be a legitimate reason for sending this back to the trial. And Attorney Eklund Mercy, your thoughts very quickly. Um, I, I think once a case has at least two 
made for TV movies that an appeal was going to be granted at some time. Like, you knew this was going to happen. It was like one of the biggest cases. Everybody wanted to be on that jury. It, it doesn't surprise me that this came up. We're going to talk to both of you in just a moment as Law and Crime Daily continues. A series of arguments today in a Minneapolis courtroom in cases involving the alleged murderers of George Floyd. Prosecutors are accusing a defense attorney for one of the officers of filing documents and making them public before they can be ruled admissible. One of the reasons for the request is because the defense wants to admit video of an earlier arrest of George Floyd in 2019. The judge ruled that material could be made public but has not ruled on whether it can actually be used at trial. And still ahead here on Law and Crime Daily, authorities in a neighboring state make a decision on whether to charge a teen accused of gunning down three people at a protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Also, a decision from a Pennsylvania prosecutor over whether the police shooting of a knife-wielding suspect was justified. Our experts weigh in when Law and Crime Daily returns right after this. And welcome back, everybody. The teen who shot three demonstrators and killed two of them in Kenosha, Wisconsin, will not face gun charges in his home state. Kyle Rittenhouse is accused of bringing an AR-15-style weapon to the disturbances and pulling the trigger in what his attorney called self-defense. The prosecutor's office in Lake County, Illinois, where Rittenhouse lives, says there's no evidence the rifle was ever in Illinois. They say the rifle was bought and stored in Wisconsin, where Rittenhouse remains charged with first-degree intentional homicide. A Pennsylvania district attorney has announced the police officer will not face charges for shooting a knife-wielding man. According to the Lancaster County DA, a woman called 911 saying Ricardo Munoz was trying to break into her home. The woman asked for Munoz to be brought to a hospital for mental health care. An unnamed officer responded to the home when Munoz suddenly appeared at the door and ran at the officer holding a knife. That's when the officer shot and killed Munoz. An investigation determined Munoz was four to seven feet away when the officer pulled the trigger. The prosecutor is calling the officer's actions justified. Former NYPD detective and law and crime expert Kirk Burkhalter says better training can help departments avoid situations like these. So this is a, it's a tragedy, and we've seen this movie before. We've seen emotionally disturbed persons confront police, and then there's no choice, right? It escalates or there's, it immediately escalates. And someone has to be the victim of deadly physical force through no fault of either side. Um, and the focus is always on the incident, right? Those, the seconds right there when those shots are fired. And I believe the focus should be on one, the training and education of the police officers. And quite often, uh, departments don't necessarily have the resources to train police officers to deal with this particular situation. However, there are other resources and jurisdictions. There are medical professionals. There are hostage negotiators within the police department. So when that call is made to the police department that, hey, there was someone in my home, they're acting aggressively, I fear for my life, they're dangerous, that goes beyond simply send the police. We're doing the police a disservice. We're doing society a disservice. Let's jump in now with some analysis. Eklund Mercy, let me start with you. In your view, is this one justified? Did the DA get the review right or not right? Well, I, I don't know. I think that it was, it, it's all fact-based. So it should have been a jury question. I feel like when, when we're dealing with facts of who felt for, you know, you felt for the, the fear for your life, I need the facts. So that's something a jury decides for the prosecution to take that out of their hands. I don't think that that was their place. I understand that there are some defenses, but unless you do that for every single um, immunity case, then you shouldn't do that just because he's a police officer. I feel that people should just, you know, the justice should be spread evenly. So unless the prosecutor does that for every single self-defense case, in which they look at it and say, hey, these facts say, you know what, we shouldn't prosecute, then that's fine. But if that's not the case, then it should have went to jury. Interesting perspective there, Eklund. Now, Terry, a lot of people might turn around and say, hey, look, if the officer is threatened, then the officer has a right to defend himself. Eklund's looking at it purely from a legal perspective that, you know, we should force a trial here. Do you disagree or not? 
Well, you know, under the law, deadly force is justified if, in fact, it's necessary and there's no other lesser way to handle the situation. I think the answer here is to make sure not just the police officers are coming, but that people who can handle the situation from a psychiatric standpoint also answer those types of calls. Interesting perspectives here out of Eklund and Terry. We'll see you again later on in the broadcast. And later on, drugs, drugs, and more drugs. One of the largest fines at a stash house ever made in the United States. Plus, a brazen theft caught on camera of an object you usually don't see stolen. We talked to the restaurant owner who's happy police caught the culprit on your screen. Federal authorities in Los Angeles announced the largest domestic seizure of methamphetamine in recent times. The DEA says more than 2,200 pounds of meth that you're looking at right here were taken from a stash house. According to the agency's director, that's more than enough to provide a dose of meth for every man, woman, and child in the United States and Mexico. Agents further found nearly 900 pounds of cocaine and 13 pounds of heroin packed inside duffel bags ready to be distributed. The seizure was part of Operation Crystal Shield, targeting cartel operations. Weird case caught on camera in downtown Cincinnati, Ohio. Surveillance video from a sports bar shows a suspect backing up his van and stealing a barbecue smoker of all things. The man took off with the smoker in tow and one day later, police say they tracked it down. Officers returned the smoker to the restaurant yesterday and this man, Mark Thomas, faces a felony theft charge. The rightful owner of that smoker is grateful to have the item back at his business. I'm excited. You know, I cook on it all the time and some days I'm like, oh, I gotta do more wings today. But I couldn't be happier today. I, I'm going to be doing wings all day and some pork and some turkey. So I'm very happy. Great. Great job by the Cincinnati Police Department. Hey, that's the spirit there. The owner says he bought a new security chain to try to ward off any future thieves. And when we come back, you'll hear from a criminal defendant who authorities say posted a video of a murder on the Internet. Now he's trying to take back his guilty plea. Can he do it? We'll discuss right after this. A young man who admitted to murdering his 17-year-old girlfriend and making a video of the killing has taken the witness stand to try to convince a judge to throw out his guilty plea. Brandon Clark admitted in open court earlier this year that he killed Bianca Devins and posted the video online. But now he claims his original attorney coerced him into thinking his guilty plea was somehow not final. Here's some of the prosecutor's questioning of Clark in an attempt to make the plea stick. At times, prosecutors forcing Clark to eat his own words and Clark saying his attorney misled him. It has never been my intention to deny my guilt in the events of July 14th. And this day should have come a lot sooner. My attorney was adamant that I really consider where I would, what I would be doing today and what it meant. And I have, and I have thought about it. Yeah, I asked him if I could take the back the plea at any time for any reason, and he told me yes. If I accept your plea of guilty today, this case will be over except for the actual sentence. Your answer, yes, Your Honor. Two of defendant Brandon Clark's defense attorneys testified at that hearing. One said no self-respecting attorney would have their client plead guilty to the max, which is what happened here. That first attorney denied giving some of the advice the defendant just claimed that he received. A second attorney said def the defendant wanted to fire the first attorney who was prepping the case for trial. It indicated to me that he was planning or wanted to fire Mr. D. Bush because he did not want to trial a trial and that Mr. Niebush was pursuing the extreme emotional distress over his objection. Okay, so that second attorney also testified that the defendant thought a trial would somehow impede his story from becoming public. So Eklund, that's kind of interesting. Usually defendants like trials because then the story becomes public, right? Mm -hmm. um, so here's the thing. I think you know, this is what happens when you're a criminal defense attorney. What happens is, is that whatever you're telling your client 
they hear something else. So, um, you know, a, a defense attorney can tell a client, especially in Georgia, like, hey, you can withdraw a plea within the term of court, but sometimes they hear within whenever you want. And after being in prison, once you're in prison for a while and once it all becomes real, that's when, you know, the... <laughs> The wheels start churning, and then sometimes people want to withdraw their plea after the fact. And I think that's what's happening here. That sounds a lot like what's going on. I think your insight is right on the money, Eklund. <laughs> Terry, do you agree, should the judge agree as well um, with, with Eklund, or should the judge agree with the defendant here and let him walk his plea back? Well, Aaron, you know, this is what I think. The judge has to consider both the testimony of the defendant and the attorney. And so, you know, the question really is, whether or not the plea was made intelligently, knowingly, and voluntarily. And in order for the judge to make that determination, he's got to listen to both sides, and he has to understand what the communication was between the attorney and the client. And actually, I think he needs to err on the side of caution and go with the client. Wow, so that could mean a new trial, and I'm talking to some local reporters who tell me the same thing, that ultimately that might be what happens here. This case may wind up going to trial. The fears locally that it's just going to be very painful for the family to watch that video get played of the actual killing. Eklund and Terry, great to be here with you both here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll do this again sometime. The rest of us, the normal crew, will be back next time for our discussions about justice in America. Hi, I'm Dan Abrams. In the exploding legal and true crime genre, Law & Crime is the only network that has it all. Good evening and welcome. This is a complicated case. Don't really jump to conclusions. We break down the case of a serial killer. Another day of drama between both sides. From multiple live trials daily to original and compelling programming, the Law & Crime Network is everywhere. And we invite you inside the jury box. This is Law & Crime.